please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Well, the tit-for-tat tariff tussle between the world's two largest economies, the US and China, refuses to die down. In fact, it is rapidly escalating into a full-blown trade war. The latest standoff between the two countries was triggered by Donald Trump's decision last week to impose 25% tariff on Chinese goods worth $50 billion. Beijing retaliated by imposing 25% tariff on US goods worth $34 billion. Now, an angry Donald Trump has threatened China with a new raft of tariffs. He's asked his team to identify... $200 billion worth of Chinese goods for additional tariffs at a rate of 10%. China, however, has made it clear that it won't be the first one to blink. Chinese government has pledged to fight back if Trump goes ahead with his plans. What are the implications of this trade standoff between the U.S. and China? And will the threat that President Trump has held out when it comes to India be taken forward too? Those are the questions that we ask Shailesh Kumar, Director for Asia at the Eurasia Group, also with us, former Commerce Secretary Rahul Kular and Rajiv Kher, former Commerce Secretary as well. But before we begin the discussion, let me go across to CNBC's Yunus Yoon, who joined us now from Beijing. Yunus, what is China's action plan now? All right, Yunus, you'd appreciate you joining us. It's not just the markets in China, but global markets nervous uh, on the back of the escalation in the tariff war that we're currently seeing. We're now joined by Shailesh Kumar, Director for Asia, the Eurasia Group, former Commerce Secretaries Rahul Kular and Rajiv Kher as well. Mr. Kular, let me start by asking you, sir, uh, you know, the expectation or rather the hope uh, till about a month ago was that this is going to not escalate into a full-blown trade war between the U.S. and China. But the developments over over the last 48 hours seem to indicate otherwise. Yunus was there talking about the fact that uh, uh, the view in the U.S. is that China may not have enough bullets to fire uh, at the U.S. What is your own assessment of A, uh, are we heading to a full-blown trade war, and B, what would you now expect by way of retaliation from China? Um, very quickly, I think all bigger thy neighbor policies work uh, only if the neighbor does not respond. But once the neighbor responds and retaliates, then it's no longer a zero-sum game, and everybody loses. So what you're seeing being played out is well understood by everybody. And um, I'm not surprised that there is some escalation because uh, Mr. Trump is pandering to his uh, supporters and uh, mm. President Xi has his own problem. So I'm not surprised by the escalation. As far as uh, resolving matters, I suspect that uh, things will not go completely haywire. I mean, at least let me say, I hope they will not go haywire. Uh, my guess is that um, China will respond to anything that the U.S. does. And uh, mm. I think saner, saner counsel will prevail and they'll try to work out something. So <laughs> I, I still am optimistic on that. Okay, so you're still optimistic that there will be a negotiation that will work. But uh, yeah. Mr. Kher, would you share Mr. Kuller's uh, optimism? And also, uh, what do you believe could be the options that uh, the Chinese could leverage or exercise? Uh, we heard some from Yunus, but there's also the talk that, uh, uh, you know, while there could be action against U.S. companies based in China, we could also perhaps see China move towards currency devaluation, sell treasury, and also ease sanctions against North Korea. Uh, this could all be part of the arsenal. Uh, for China, what would your expectation be? Well, uh, to begin with, uh, I think Mr. Kuller is absolutely right in saying that this is a lose-all kind of a situation because if you escalate this trade war, it is only going to be at the detriment of everyone who is involved. Uh, having said that, uh, we need to recognize that China is more, in terms of trade, China is exposed more to the vagaries of U.S. policy establishment because of obvious reasons that China mm. is exporting more to the U.S. and elsewhere. And therefore, China is bound to be a bigger loser in a purely trade-related scenario. But having said that, mm. we also need mm. to recognize that this appears not just a trade war. This is trade is essentially an indicator. And essentially what we are getting into is a much broader uh, shake-up. It is trade is, uh, is, is essential, mm. it's manifested, but uh, clearly we are looking at war at several fronts. 
and uh, trade is more pronounced okay. because it's visible and it's countable and therefore you see more uh, manifestation mm -hmm. on the trade side but clearly uh, the, the repercussions in China will, will, be, uh, will be shown in uh, many other non-trade areas so, so that is something which mm. I cannot at the, at the moment fathom but, but surely intellectual property uh, uh, treat, treatment of uh, the US businesses and so on because if it is a lose-lose game yeah. then uh, yeah. nobody seems to be worried about what, what is the consequence Mm -hmm. uh, Shailesh, let me ask you now, uh, is the expectation uh, uh, that we are going to see a big shake-up and this is no longer going to be restricted merely to trade, that this is going to escalate well beyond that and the Chinese will retaliate uh, if uh, President Trump decides to go ahead uh, with the threat of imposing further tariffs? Hi, Shireen. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that this is going to go beyond the economic lens. Uh, you may see more additional threats on tariffs, specifically with China. But keep in mind how Trump has been operating until now. So, so for example, the initial push was against China. It then es expanded out to Canada and Mexico and some of the U.S. allies in Europe. Mm. The main focus for him is the domestic audience at the, at, at the core. His agenda yeah. is to appease those of his voters who, are, who believe that they've been affected by what they claim to be unfair trade practices. So if you look at the sectors yeah. he tends to go against, and with the Canada example recently, it's been steel. You know, the steel has been somewhat sensitive in past administrations too, but with him retaliating against Canada, which isn't even really a threat on the, on the trade front, to be honest, but for him to go against Canada on right. steel, what he's trying to do is send a signal to the, what he believes is his voting base in parts of America, in the manufacturing, or not even manufacturing, but more of the commodity sector, like the steel industry, like coal and elsewhere, mm. to show to them that he's standing up for their rights. So part of it is public politics, domestic politics. Yes, but then there's the other part of it, which is his views in terms of America's being taken, taken advantage of, that these policies past presidents and past administrations have put in place have been unfair to the U.S. population. You know, why does America have a trade deficit? Yeah. So then it expands into ideology, which is why is it that America helped mm. facilitate the rise of China by allowing the creation of this trade deficit? So that's why he's going after these countries and signaling these bigger, bigger trade, uh, these bigger, bigger trade tariff numbers because he sees trade deficits as bad. And if you go after it and you go after specific sectors and countries, you help the U.S. politics and help you win in, 20, in the next election in 2020. At least that's how he sees it. So that's why okay. I don't see this going okay, beyond economics. Okay, that's how he sees it, addressing yes, the domestic it, constituency. It could get bad. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, let me ask you then, uh, Shailesh, about uh, what this means now for India, because, you know, President Trump has been calling out India uh, for high tariffs. In fact, uh, in your latest piece, you write that uh, uh, Trump is not factually wrong to say that India charges 100% tariffs, but he's wrong in implying that these taxes are targeted only at the U.S. So you believe that U.S. is not interested in a trade war with India, not just yet at least? Not yet, because, yes, and... and the first point is he's not actually wrong in saying Indian tariffs in some sectors are high. That's, 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 I don't think anyone would dispute that point. But as I mentioned, the, they're not aimed against America. Now, he may not realize that, but that's a different point. But they're not aimed against America. But compare the U.S.-India trade deficit against the U.S.-China. But compare the U.S.-India trade deficit against the U.S.-China one. And there's a huge, huge difference. Yeah. So just simply yeah. on a numerical basis, going after India doesn't really do much. Mm. Second is he and, you know, we've seen this happen since his, his presidency. He doesn't view India the way he views the rest of the world. He almost has a bit of a soft spot for India. He sees uh, what mm. India may be going through in terms of its well, he said where he it has is in this part of the world. Here. That's part of it, too. Um, but... But you haven't seen him aggressively go after India. Yes, he's made comments. He recently made the comment, but they're almost offhand comments. They're not part of a bigger policy push. Mm. Within the U.S. cycle amongst mm. policymakers and the, you know, the, the community of, of commentators, it hasn't even really picked up. And when he, when he talks about tariffs, people usually talk about China or now Canada in this case. India doesn't really get much mention. No one's worried mm. about it. Ultimately, he doesn't gain anything really politically by going after India, and nor does the country gain economically okay. by going after India. So the, what you're seeing on the retaliation mm. in the last week on the Indian side about now going and hitting America, for example, on some tariffs, 
even that's not really getting much mention on the U.S. side because it doesn't amount to a whole lot in terms of dollars. Okay. So it's not, I don't see this as being uh, a critical okay. factor. It's not going to push the needle. It's not going to push the needle. Uh, Mr. Kula, would you agree with what you just heard there from Shailesh that, uh, you know, we've got a $22 billion trade deficit with the U.S. It pales in comparison uh, to what uh, the U.S. has with China. And while we might see this rhetoric from time to time from President Trump, uh, there is no cause for alarm just yet for India. Um, let me put it, uh, I agree with Shailesh in some respects and not in some others. Uh, the point is that if there are MFN tariffs which are raised, which means there is no targeting of any particular country, tariffs are just hiked as they are, and they are hiked across the board, across a number of uh, sectors or commodities, then whether you like it or not, we get hurt. Uh, it may well be that China is the biggest exporter to, of that particular good to the U.S., uh, but we may be big players. But even in our bid, hmm. if that tariff goes up, we get hurt. We get we get hurt. So even if India is not targeted, the prospect of a trade war hmm. uh, does imply that India is under threat, even if it's not done politically or through language. The the effect of the tariffs will mean uh, economic have, will have economic consequences. The second thing, which perhaps hmm. I I think uh, should mention, is that look. If the American position is that, look, trade is not fair and therefore we are resorting to this, well, there are ways to deal with fair trade, you know, unfair trade. If, uh, if somebody is selling below cost, you levy an anti-dumping duty. If somebody is uh, imposing a subsidy or providing a subsidy, you use countervailing measures and so on. So that there are institutional ways of dealing with what we call unfair trade. However, Mr. Trump has decided right. that what he will do is he will raise tariffs. Now, the important thing about how he's raised tariffs is that what he has done is he has already breached the bound levels which America has committed to in the WTO. That is to say, mm. if America said that I will not raise, I will not have tariffs at more than 5% on aluminium, then when it raises yeah. those tariffs to 50%, Leave aside the economic consequence of that, it is also directly in breach mm. of an international agreement which it was a party to at the WTO. Okay? Mm. So I, I, I think that's right. the way to, okay. to look at it. There are, there are two separate dimensions, sure. and India cannot say that it will not be affected. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kher, uh, you know, while we may not have cause for alarm just yet, India has notified the WTO that it intends to impose retaliatory measures starting the 21st, and this is on account of the steel and aluminum tariffs that the U.S. had imposed. Uh, given the fact that we're going through with that, do you believe that the complexion of the discourse between the U.S. and India could change post that? Uh, see, this is to be seen in the context of, uh, first, what uh, earlier Shailesh said, that India and U.S. have been allies as far as uh, economic uh, cooperation is concerned. And uh, therefore, uh, well, we, we believe that U.S. will not take a major which brackets India with, uh, let's say, the likes of China, as far as U.S. Uh, bilateral trade is concerned. But uh, having said that, I think we need to recognize that there are two aspects to this whole issue. One is, of course, this larger issue of uh, a trade war, and the other is the bilateral issues between the U.S. and India. We only recently had the Commerce mm. Minister visiting uh, Washington, and the conversation is reported to have gone very well. And uh, clearly, if you recall the old uh, American style of diplomacy, uh, it always starts with a certain mm. amount of bullying. And then uh, the two sides come on the, uh, on the table, they discuss. And what is expected of, from India is to give in, to give in on a certain, uh, certain issues. And now there are outstanding issues mm. between U.S. and India. And it is very unlikely that in many of those issues, India would be in a position to give, give in because those issues are very fundamental to the manner in which India's policy has evolved. And therefore, hmm. this could also be, in a sense, 
uh, 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 some kind of a first step towards a bilateral engagement that is about to follow and uh, uh, building up a right kind of an ecosystem for a conversation. But having said that, we also mm. know that India has retaliated. And uh, India has retaliated, and if you look at the list of products on which the tariffs have been yeah. imposed, and some of those uh, items, are, the tariff has even gone beyond the, beyond the bound limits. So clearly, India has also mm. chosen to associate itself with the rest of the uh, challengers, the China, uh, EU, Canada, and so on. Uh, I think this is where yeah. the, the, the real issue comes in. Should India be taking that position or should India be sorting out its problems with the U.S. in a more uh, sophisticated bilateral manner? I think that's the larger what question. What do you feel? Moment. What do you feel? Do you believe that we should be part of the challengers camp or do you believe that we should engage with the U.S. bilaterally and, and sort our issues out? I think we need to look at it in a, in a, uh, in a holistic concept. Uh, it would have been very difficult for India to stay out of this race which has started uh, with China and uh, EU and the others also joining the race. Uh, it would have been very difficult for India. So, so there is an element of diplomacy and politics in it. But at the same time, we also need to recognize that the loss on account of uh, the duty increases on uh, steel and aluminium is not so significant for Indian trade as India should have chosen to mm. uh, pick up a product like, uh, like uh, uh, motorcycles, which are above 800 cc, which are okay. not made in India and are imported in, in India only from the US. So maybe we could have, we could have nuanced right. our reaction. We could have taken the same reaction. We mm. could have, we could mm. have nuanced it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kuller, would you agree that there are, ought to have been more nuancing in terms of India's response? And what do you believe is non-negotiable uh, as we sit across the table? Um, uh, at, uh, bilateral discussion is uh, going to happen right now. I think uh, the political posturing both in America and in other parts of the world is too strident at this point of time for somebody to say that, look, I'll do a backroom deal with you through bilateral negotiations, which is why uh, there may be a time for it, but it's definitely not now. Second, politically, okay. it, was Im it is impossible for uh, a government in India to just sit by and uh, watch mm. the U.S. impose a bigger thy neighbor strategy and get beggared. Uh, meaning, as I said right at the beginning, such strategies work if and only if the neighbor does not retaliate. But that is stupid because yeah. every neighbor will retaliate. And that's exactly what you're seeing in Europe, in uh, India, and in Canada. So I don't mm. think you should ignore what they are doing. Some of it is also a political signal to, to Mr. Trump that there are limits to which you can go in pushing this agenda, uh, because mm. if your war, war is with China, fight it somewhere else. You don't need to have collateral damage all over mm. the place. And I think that message is part of the subtext of these retaliatory moves. Politically, I think it was impossible for government not to have done something like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm mm. clear on that. To Rajiv's point, I think Two things, I, mean, I didn't want to talk about Harley Davidson, but I do want to talk about other categories <laughs> which I include, included there. Uh, apples, pistachios, yeah. almonds, raisins. Mm. This is the entire West mm. Coast, okay? You're talking about California up to Washington mm. State. Mm. These hurt, okay? These genuinely hurt. And there's a very vocal lobby there which... Uh, is concerned about these consequences. So I think to the extent they have chosen such words, it is also a political signal from India to the United States that if you can hurt us, we can also target mm. and hurt you where it actually pinches because those are very strong lobby groups mm. Mm. Uh, which will make a noise. So Mr. Trump will at some point have to do this trade-off, you know, do I support the guys who are...
Right. So you're saying that it would have been impossible for India not to act and the fact that they've chosen to go after things like apples, pistachio, almond and raisins uh, is really sending out a message to uh, the Trump administration that India is serious about its retaliatory uh, measures. Shalish, a quick final word from you. You heard what both uh, the former Commerce Secretaries had to say. How do you expect the U.S. to respond to the retaliatory measures that kick in? Sure, thanks. <clears throat> A couple quick points. One is on the point about India going against agricultural goods. The only counterpoint to keep in mind is the states that will be most affected in the U.S. are not Republican states. These are California is a deeply Democratic state. If its economy were to be hurt somehow by this, it will not affect Trump. He could care less if the Democrats in California don't like him because it's not a state that uh, Republicans typically carry anyway. So where India may have been better advised is to pick products that emanate from states that are very Republican and very deeply Trump supporters, because that's something that will really pinch okay. him in the next election if they start mm. to feel adverse consequences. And this is exactly what you saw the Europeans do when they targeted bourbon, for example, mm. which is made in parts of America mm. that are very Republican. Mm. Second point is uh, how will America be affected in general? The thing is, the, the response from India may be seen, at least in American circles, I'm not saying agree or disagree with this, but it may be seen as coming from out of nowhere, because, again, much of this conversation in Washington has been vis-a-vis -vis China, what China is doing. So, yes, I, I, I agree, and I understand mm. that India would be affected by these on the back end, but for India to retaliate by raising its own tariffs in a regime where Indian tariffs are already seen as being high in many cases may seem as... Yeah. counterproductive or may seem as if it's coming out of nowhere. So what, what India may benefit from in this example would be, as you pointed out, having more of a bilateral engagement and sorting these things out. I understand the politics may not be conducive for that, but that may have been the better way to go. Okay, that may have been the better way to go. Well, uh, we will see uh, how the U.S. chooses to respond to India's retaliatory moves. But for now, uh, global markets nervous on the escalation, the war of words and tariffs between the U.S. and China. And as uh, two former Commerce Secretaries and Shailesh point out, uh, this is going to have collateral damage uh, and could possibly impact global growth, which is in a fine fettle today. Uh, Rajiv K, Rahul Kurar and Shailesh Kumar, appreciate you joining us here on the CNBC TV 18 special appreciate your time and thanks for joining us this evening time for us to head into a break a lot more coming up don't go anywhere